In this video, we're gonna begin discussing the key reactions of monosaccharides. And a number of these reactions generalize to disaccharides and polysaccharides as well. So the slide might as well say the reactions of carbohydrates. And like all biochemical monomers, sugars contain both nucleophilic and electrophilic groups in the same molecule. This is ultimately what enables their polymerization. A nucleophile on one molecule can hook up with an electrophile on another molecule, and we've still got nucleophiles and electrophiles on the ends that can continue to react with each other to lengthen out the chain. And in sugars, the key nucleophilic groups are the hydroxyls, and we'll look at nucleophilic reactions of the hydroxyls that honestly we've already seen. Things like acylation, making an ether with an SN2 reaction, and things like this, as well as things like oxidation of the hydroxyl groups to carbonyl groups. The anomeric carbon, which is the carbonyl carbon in the open chain form, and the hemiacetal carbon in the closed form, is electrophilic. And it does things that are characteristic of carbonyls and hemiacetals and acetals. It can form acetals, it can form related structures at the same oxidation level of plus two, it can be attacked by nucleophiles, it can be reduced to an alcohol, all that good stuff. So. Um, in the in sort of a bird's eye view of the reactions that we'll talk about here, we're going to start with nucleophilic reactivity of the hydroxyl groups. Look at acylation, formation of an ester, and ether formation. We'll see how the hydroxyl groups can get involved in polymerization as nucleophiles by reacting with the anomeric carbon of another sugar molecule. And we'll talk a little bit about cyclization. And we've already talked a great deal about cyclization, in fact, the formation of hemiacetals from the open chain form. That's where the nucleophilic reactivity of the hydroxyl group shines in an intramolecular sense. When it comes to electrophilic reactivity of the anomeric carbon, nucleophilic addition is probably the most important reaction we think about here. That encompasses reduction, right, with something like a sodium borohydride reducing agent, as well as glycoside formation, which is a reaction we'll see as highly, highly analogous to acetal formation, which we've seen in the past. And then a third mode of reactivity, which is definitely worth keeping in mind, but at least in my experience, is very easy to miss when it comes to thinking about carbohydrates, is the carbonyl alpha carbons are mildly acidic, right? These are alpha carbons of aldehydes and ketones, and we've seen in the past how these can make enolates. Sugars can make enolates as well in many cases, and those enolates have a unique property because of all of these oxygens in the vicinity of the alpha carbon. We'll tackle those unique properties when we talk about the acidic reactivity of carbonyl alpha carbons in sugars. This leads to epimerization, which is a stereochemical change at alpha carbons to carbonyl groups in sugars. Aldol and related condensations, which can be very important in the practical reactivity and biochemical behavior of sugars, as well as what might be my favorite reaction of carbohydrates, which is carbonyl migration, the conversion of an aldose into a ketose or vice versa. It looks like the most bizarre reaction in the world because where one carbon is undergoing reduction, the carbon next door is undergoing oxidation. So it looks like some kind of funky hydride shift when in fact, all it involves is very simple proton transfers based on this fundamental idea that we can form enolates by deprotonating alpha to a carbonyl carbon and enolates can be reprotonated at the alpha carbon once they're formed. Here we're gonna focus on the nucleophilic reactivity of the hydroxyl group with electrophilic external reagents. And the two big categories of reaction here to keep in mind are acylation, which is a nucleophilic acyl substitution process where the substitution is happening in the electrophilic reagent that we use, which is a source of some electrophilic acyl group. And then SN2 etherification, akin to the Williamson ether synthesis, which you may have already seen in an earlier organic course. And the basic idea here is to use some kind of alkyl halide electrophile in combination with the nucleophilic hydroxyl group to establish an ether. Let's start with acylation. 
Now, because all of these hydroxyl groups are more or less the same when it comes to their nucleophilic reactivity, they're all just OHs, no resonance, nothing too special. They have slight differences in steric environment is the only thing. This hydroxyl is primary. This hydroxyl is primary while all the others are secondary. Aside from that very small and often very subtle differences, uh, difference, all the hydroxyl groups are pretty much the same. And so what we need to do here is use an excess of the electrophilic acyl source and very commonly we use something like acetic anhydride. Let's remind ourselves about the structure of acetic anhydride and see why it's electrophilic. Acetic anhydride, the right way to think about it is one of those carbonyl groups is electrophilic and the other carbonyl group is part of a good leaving group. Here it's OAC, the um, acetate anion. And so this is kind of like acetyl Acetate is one way to think about acetic anhydride. And honestly, if you thought about it and called it in your mind acetyl acetate, that would give you a great idea of how this molecule reacts. It's electrophilic at the carbonyl carbon highlighted in blue. So the idea here is a nucleophilic hydroxyl is going to displace acetate, ultimately acetic acid or pyridinium acetate at the end of the day, thanks to this pyridine base. And we get acetyl groups added to all of those free hydroxyls in the closed form of the sugar. So we also acetylate, notice, the anomeric hydroxyl because, of course, the sugar is mostly in the closed form, and so that OH will react very easily with acetic anhydride, just like all the other OHs in the molecule. When it comes to making ethers, it's a similar idea. All the hydroxyl groups are nucleophilic. They're all pretty much at the same level of nucleophilic power, if you will. The difference here is instead of using an acyl electrophile, we're using an alkyl electrophile, something like methyl iodide. Usually the ethers we're installing here are very small and very simple, simple because this is often used for a protecting or a detection strategy, as we may touch on a little bit later. So we combine, first of all, silver one oxide, which is a base, purpose in life is to deprotonate the hydroxyl groups, with methyl iodide, which is an alkyl electrophile, right? The carbon in CH3I is electrophilic, I is a good leaving group, and so what we're looking at here is an SN2 displacement of iodide by those nucleophilic oxygens. And here again, because they're all pretty much the same in terms of nucleophilicity, we're going to use an excess of methyl iodide, which I left off the reaction scheme, but you should pretty much always assume is there. And we're going to install methyl groups at all of the carbons here. So notice the anomeric hydroxyl does pick up a methyl along with all of the other hydroxyl groups in the sugar. So we might call this exhaustive methylation, for example. And in the first case, we may refer to this as exhaustive acetylation. 